Well, good afternoon now, everyone, and welcome to um, the 31st summit of the British Irish Council. Slightly sorry for the, the slight delay, but we're not too o over time. Five months on from the Council's last meeting in June, Ministers took the opportunity to consider key political developments across their jurisdictions and provide an overview of domestic developments. Ministers reaffirmed the importance of the Council and its role in promoting harmonious and mutually beneficial relationships across these islands as set out in the 1998 agreement. The Council agreed that political developments underline the importance of this forum to exchange views and strengthen relationships across member administrations. The Council received an update on engagements in Northern Ireland and looked forward to the restoration of the, developed, of the devolved institutions in Northern Ireland as soon as possible. Ministers also updated the Council on their activity in relation to the EU's exit from the European Union, particularly with reference to engagement between member administrations. They discussed the importance of maintaining the constitutional and formal relationships across the United Kingdom and the Crown dependencies. The Council engaged on topics including the economy and trade, free movement of people and goods, the common travel area and ongoing relations with the, United, with the European Union. Regarding digital inclusion, Ministers with particular responsibility for digital inclusion met in advance of the summit meeting to consider a paper prepared by the Council's digital inclusion work sector. Ministers noted that while recent evidence has shown that more people are getting online than ever before, there remained key barriers with, which prevent people from taking their first steps online, including issues of accessibility, digital skills and motivation. To address these, Ministers discussed future challenges and identified priority issues for the British Irish Council digital inclusion work sector, including digital rights, digital skills and literacy, and partnership working between the BIC administrations. A new forward work programme was agreed for the work sector to reflect the priorities discussed during this meeting. Now, open to any questions. And if, when you ask a question, if you could say who you're representing. You, sir. Uh, Sh Shane Harrison, BBC. Um, can I ask questions of uh, David Lindington and the Taoiseach? Um, in the context of what we now know about the toing and froing of letters between the DUP and the Prime Minister, Mr Lindington, can you reassure the DUP that a Northern Ireland backstop will not be in the withdrawal agreement? And Taoiseach, do you expect a Northern Ireland backstop to go into the withdrawal agreement? Does this thing need to it works? Um, we obviously we don't ever sort of comment on on the alleged leaked documents, but the uh, the position it remains it always has been that um, we are working to with the the commission to deliver on the commitments that were made in the joint report of December 2017, and that means you know, all the various commitments that were made in that joint report. Um, and the Prime Minister has always been very clear that you know, we don't, uh, won't accept something that involves sort of carving out Northern Ireland from the rest of the United Kingdom. I'm sorry, but t -shirt. Well, well, first of all, it's a real pleasure to be here in, in the Isle of Man. Um, Majin Mayagov, is that right? Majin Mai? Oh, more am I. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Manx is very similar to Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I? Okay, almost right. Um, and just, just before I answer the question, just, just briefly to acknowledge, of course, that the British Irish Council is is a Good Friday Agreement institution. So it's even though all parts of the Good Friday Agreement may not be operating at the moment, uh, this aspect of it is. Uh, and the um, authors of the Good Friday Agreement 20 years ago um, could not have foreseen all that would take place uh, in the 20 years that followed, but they were very far seeing. Uh, and more and more, I realised the extent to which they recognised that there was a totality of relationships. Uh, in this part of the world uh, between uh, Northern Ireland and Ireland, between Ireland and the UK, but also involving all seven jurisdictions uh, and, and all five islands. And this is a very uh, valuable, I think, uh, expression of that totality of relationships. I had a chance to speak today, obviously, about Northern Ireland and everyone's desire to have the um, Executive and Assembly uh, functioning again on Brexit as well, uh, and uh, the progress being made in those negotiations, uh, and also the issue of digital inclusion, which our ministers, including Minister Say Canny, uh, were involved in discussing last night and this morning. Uh, in terms of the, the backstop, what's uh, envisaged is that it would be there as a protocol to the withdrawal agreement. 
Uh, but I think when we talk about the backstop, we should always recall what the objective is. Uh, and the most important thing for me is the objective, uh, and that is to uh, give everyone uh, in Northern Ireland and Ireland the uh, assurance that a hard border will not develop between North and South, no matter what else uh, may happen in, in the years ahead. Uh, and that is why we're seeking one that is legally operative uh, and one that uh, gives us that guarantee that is necessary. Uh, I think we are at a sensitive point in the negotiations. Um, a successful outcome is not guaranteed, uh, but uh, I think it is possible in the next couple of weeks, and probably with that in mind, uh, the less said the better about the, the detail of that. Uh, a question to uh, Patty Shock, um, Cabinet, 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 uh, Cabinet Office Minister and uh, First Minister. Sorry, could you state Oxford? who you're representing? Oh, sorry, James Williams, BBC Wales. Um, to start with, um, Dominic Raab, the Brexit Secretary, uh, said this week that he wasn't aware initially of the importance of the Dover Calais route. Are you, as uh, Taoiseach, aware of the importance of the Dublin Holyhead route? And are you concerned that how these negotiations are going and the potential breakdown that that could have a big impact on, on that route? Also, on you know the the big question now is about the detail of trying to avoid a avoid a hard border in Ireland, unless something gives you, we're potentially looking at a no deal Brexit, which of course is potentially going to lead to a hard border on, in on Ireland. So, does do both sides need to to give something here? Uh, to the cabinet office minister, I, I want to ask about a, quest, a statement made by the uh, first minister uh, today. He's laying the blame of uh, Schaffler, the German automobile uh, decision earlier this week to close a plant in uh, Fenetti, firmly at your feet saying that it's your shambolic handling of the Brexit negotiations that is to blame for that. So could I have your response on that? And then First Minister, if you could elaborate on that point. Whoever fancies the first. <laughs> I, I think I might say the first one, uh, as you asked me first, um, yes, we're very much aware of the importance of the Dublin uh, Hollyhead link. Uh, have had the pleasure to be Minister for Transport for three and a half years in Ireland, so Dublin Port fell under my remit and uh, the chance to visit and see those operations uh, on, on many occasions. And it's not just the importance of the Dublin Hollyhead link, it's also the land bridge through the UK. Uh, a huge amount of our trade uh, with uh, continental Europe goes through Hollyhead and uh, then on from Dover through, through Calais. Um, there are ways around, uh, by boats to Rotterdam and Antwerp um, and to France, but much slower. Uh, and also very aware that a huge amount of trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain actually goes through Dublin Port uh, because the quick way to get to the south of England is through Dublin, not, not through uh, Lauren or Stranraer, as you can imagine, and that's a very important uh, link as well. So um, my objective when it comes to trade is to uh, do everything we can to avoid the emergence of any new uh, borders among any of us. Uh, and that's what the European Union gave us, which was uh, border-free trade uh, between Britain and, and Ireland and all of the European Union. Um, the fact that Brexit is happening makes that difficult to replicate, but uh, our objective certainly as an Irish government uh, is to do that uh, if we can, to the extent that we can, in order to allow people to travel freely as they have been for so long now, but also to allow trade to function as it does now. David. I, on, um, I might echo what the Taoiseach said about the importance of those trade routes. If you look at, um, I mean, the, the, the north-south trade on the island of Ireland is clearly important. It, it's important to the way in which a lot of small businesses in particular operate, a lot of uh, agri-food businesses on the island operate, um, and it has massive um, political and symbolic significance, as well as anybody who sat down with people in Derry, London, Derry, or Murray, or Dundalk will testify. But in pure economic terms, the east-west trade between both Northern Ireland and GB and uh, Ireland and GB is far more important than the value of the trade that moves north-south across the jurisdictional borders. So that, to my mind, <laughs> reinforces the fact that it is in the interests of everybody in these islands that we get both uh, an agreement on uh, the withdrawal deal, uh, which gives the certainty of the implementation period, uh, and at the same time a political declaration about uh, the future partnership, and a future partnership where um, the EU27 as well as the United Kingdom uh, accept and work towards the objective of 
frictionless trade between our respective jurisdictions. That is the thing that will work best for businesses, for living standards of prosperity um, in every, every part of um, the island of Ireland, every part of the United Kingdom, for that matter, I think, in the Crown Dependencies as well. Um, on the particular question that you asked about um, the company internationally, um, it's difficult for me to do it. I don't know the details of that company's operations to, to comment on that. Um, and uh, different companies at different times find that market conditions are affecting them. A number of uh, automotive companies at the moment are finding that, that the sales, more generally, the demand in the market is not what they had uh, expected it to, to be. Um, but at the same time, you look at the, um, the, the pattern of inward investment into the United Kingdom, and in the last year, we were still attracting uh, more uh, third country inward investment to the UK than uh, any other member state of the European Union. So I think that the track record shows that our um, uh, uh, attractiveness as a destination for third country inward investment remains very powerful indeed. Now, I'm absolutely convinced that one of the benefits of uh, uh, a successful outcome to the current negotiations would be a reinforcement of that position. And that is a reason, again, why I think it's in the interest of everybody in the United Kingdom that we get uh, an early and comprehensive resolution of uh, those negotiations so that we can move on and construct a sort of deep and special future partnership that I think is in the interest of all countries involved. Can I go to stay or just English? We, we'll, we'll speak later in Russia, it's okay. I'll just stay again. Okay. Uh, well, in terms of shape, uh, those are not my words, they're their words. Uh, they said that Brexit is uh, one of the major issues that's caused them to look to uh, close uh, the plant in uh, in It emphasises to me the need to get certainty as quickly as possible. Uh, David and I have discussed this this morning, uh, along with, with, with First of Scotland, uh, and uh, we all understand that uh, business needs certainty more than anything else. Uh, I hope over the next uh, Few weeks we will get that certainty so business feels that they are now operating in a situation uh, where they can see the future because at the moment uh, it's very difficult for them. Just since the summer particularly uh, they've become concerned that there might be a no deal uh, and as a result of that they've started taking decisions that are not uh, good decisions as far as we are concerned. Schaefer is of course an example of that. I think on the issue of the hard border we well understand of course um, the issues surrounding the border on the island of Ireland but it's important to avoid a hard border between Ireland and the UK. The last thing I want to see is a hard border between Ireland and Wales. 70% of trade between G and Ireland goes to the Welsh ports. If there's extra bureaucracy, um, extra checks at the Welsh ports, uh, that will have an effect on the ports themselves and of course on the road structure at the end of the ports, both of which are default. Uh, we run the ports, we run the roads, uh, there is a danger but if we had a hard Brexit, uh, with no deal, for example, uh, then we would end up having to pay uh, a huge amount of money uh, on the port and on the roads in order to accommodate the, uh, the traffic that would be delayed there as a result of, of uh, any, any position of extra controls. So it's hugely important for us in Wales to avoid that as well. So a hard border, of course, we want to see that avoided in Ireland, but we also want to see it avoided in the sea as well. I hear what David says, of course, about um, the avoiding a hard border down the Irish Sea. That applies uh, as much to Wales as it does to, uh, to anywhere else. The last thing I want to see is a situation created where uh, freight moves through the ports of Northern Ireland. Uh, we have no direct link with Northern Ireland, of course, because the Welsh ports were seen as more problematic. That clearly would have an effect on trade and our jobs. Thank you. Lady on the second row, and then Adrian. Yes, Fiona Mitchell from RTE News. Uh, Tisha, just wondering, um, do you feel that that letter from Theresa May now potentially leaves the way open for regulatory checks on goods between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK? And do you think that maybe, or do you think that maybe this is Theresa May simply reinforcing that any backstop has to be time limited? And given the response of the DUP so far to that letter, how much damage do you think that this potentially does to being able to reach a deal at all? Uh, well, I, I suppose you're, you're asking me about uh, correspondence between Prime Minister May and the DUP and 
um, I, I'm a third party in, in that particular conversation, so it's probably best for me not, not to speak on behalf either of the Prime Minister or the DUP, that they're very much able to speak for, uh, speak for themselves. Um, but I do think when it comes to uh, Northern Ireland, uh, it's very important to listen to and have regard to what the DUP has to say. Uh, but there are other political parties as well. Uh, who represent um, the majority of people in Northern Ireland uh, and there's also Northern Ireland business and Northern Ireland farmers and people who live in Northern Ireland uh, I think we really have to have regard to uh, that as well uh, in coming to any conclusions uh, and certainly uh, you know, the position of the Irish government uh, ha has always been that we don't want to see any new borders uh, between us uh, and that applies uh, as much between um, Lyon and Stranraer or between uh, Belfast and London as it does between uh, Newry and Dundalk or, 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 or Derry and London Derry. We're not the ones here who are seeking uh, any borders or any new checks of, of, of any sort, um, but Brexit has given risen to a difficult situation uh, and we need to resolve that. Adrian. Adrian from Island Man Newspapers says the question for um, Howard Cole, Chief Minister, the Taoiseach and uh, the First Minister of Scotland. What are your thoughts on how Brexit will impact on relations between um, Ireland, uh, Scotland, Wales and the Crown dependencies in whatever form that is? And how confident mm -hmm. are you that we will get a deal and how soon? Right, well I'll kick that one off. Okay. F first, obviously the benefit and the beauty of the British Irish Council is that the Isle of Man can have good working relationships with Ireland Scotland, Wales and, and, and the rest of our, of our colleagues, it's really important. It gives us an opportunity to raise the, the concerns that we have. The Isle of Man is in the middle of the Irish Sea. Our closest neighbours are geographically Ireland, Scotland <laughs> and, and, and Wales. So we are obviously concerned, but I think the sooner the better that an agreement can be reached. I suppose the definition of what a good agreement will be, we can all have various viewpoints on but this organisation is, is key, certainly from an Isle of Man point of view, to ensuring that we are well represented. Uh, well, firstly, on uh, the, the last part of your question, how likely do I think it is that there will be a deal? I'm not uh, party to these negotiations. Uh, clearly, the next few days are going to be uh, critical and we will require to wait and see uh, what transpires. I think one of the issues uh, that still uh, dogs these talks is that the United Kingdom government appears to be still in a process of negotiating uh, amongst itself rather than presenting a, a coherent, uh, unified position in the negotiation with the EU27. Uh, and obviously, if that is the case, that gives rise to the risk that whatever emerges, if a deal is struck over the coming days, that that will prove challenging to uh, get through the political process in the United Kingdom, but we, we have to wait and see. One of the things I uh, have said often and, and will say again is if th that doesn't prove possible, if the deal can be struck or perhaps uh, more likely if it is but can command a majority in the House of Commons, we mustn't, any of us, assume that that makes crashing out of the EU next March with no deal inevitable. Um, instead, in my view, that should open up other options and uh, my preferred option all along if the UK is leaving the EU which I regret is that it should seek to stay within the single market and the customs union which would obviously uh, resolve along the way the issues around uh, both the uh, Northern Irish uh, Republic border and the, the border between Ireland and uh, GB. In terms of the relationships, I mean, I uh, will make no bones about the fact that the, the Brexit experience has uh, exposed real uh, weaknesses within the devolution settlement, and I only speak for Scotland uh, right now, that will require to be worked through and, uh, and resolved along the way. Uh, there have been frustrations on the part of the Scottish Government uh, about lack of engagement and involvement. Obviously, we've had quite heated debates and discussions around uh, power grabs on the devolved uh, parliaments and uh, issues around uh, how the powers of the devolved administrations are respected and there's no there's no point in, in not being upfront and frank about that and it's something uh, David and I and Karen have touched on this morning about the need to make sure that we are uh, recognising that and thinking how we resolve these issues in the future. More generally though, um, in some ways perhaps 
those issues have actually, uh, and Cameron can speak for himself, in some ways strengthened the Scotland-Wales relationship over the last couple of years, and that has uh, huge benefits uh, for a whole uh, range of reasons. Similarly, and again, uh, the Taoiseach can uh, speak for his perspective on this, from my perspective as Scottish First Minister, I don't think the relationship between Scotland and Ireland has ever been stronger uh, than it is at the moment. It's uh, an incredibly good relationship that has huge economic, uh, social and cultural uh, benefits for both of our countries. And more generally, around the British-Irish Council table, uh, I detect uh, nothing but a strong mm -hmm. desire to ensure that whatever happens in Brexit, uh, we are all working to make sure that these relationships continue to be as strong as they are, and that spirit is very uh, evident around the British Irish Council table. All of this hope, obviously, that Northern Ireland, uh, the Northern Irish Executive, is back around this table as quickly as possible and contributing to that. Uh, I think um, I think the answer to your question li lies in something I said a little bit earlier, which was the um, uh, amazing vision behind the Good Friday Agreement, which recognised that there were. Um, relationships across uh, these islands uh, among the five uh, islands and the seven jurisdictions um, and I think the institutions that are there in the Good Friday Agreement such as this one uh, may find themselves having a new life and new purpose uh, after Brexit. The British Irish Governmental Conference um, now meets and um, uh, David Linton, Karen Bradley, um, Sam Coleman and Charlie Fan represent the two governments at those meetings. It's not a decision-making body by any means, but it is an opportunity for the two governments to cooperate. And at the moment, because we're both members of the European Union, uh, Irish and UK ministers meet their counterparts about four times a year, and that's a huge opportunity uh, for engagement and exchange. Uh, after the UK leaves the EU next March, that won't happen anymore. But potentially, the VWIGC could be used as a mechanism to uh, have more structured cooperation uh, between uh, uh, the UK and Ireland that would never be foreseen 20 years ago when the Good Friday was the Good Friday Agreement was agreed, but I think there's potential there. And the same thing applies for the for the BIC, for the um, for the British Irish Council. Um, we're all going to be part of a common travel area. Uh, I think this body can become a forum to iron out any issues that may arise around that. Uh, and I know the Crown Dependencies were talking today about. Um, uh, some of the issues around financial services and financial regulation, and even though uh, the UK will be out of the EU, um, the Crown Dependencies obviously will continue to have major involvement with the European financial markets, so we'll be interested to have some degree of influence on what decisions are made at European level, and meeting in this context potentially allows, uh, allows us for us to have those uh, uh, kind of exchanges. Uh, on the prospects of uh, an agreement uh, before the end of the year, that would be a withdrawal agreement, plus a joint political declaration uh, on uh, the future relationship. Uh, I, I, I'm hopeful that it can be done uh, in the next few weeks. I think it's more likely than not that we will be able to uh, conclude an agreement uh, in the next few weeks before the end of the year, but um, lots of things can go wrong. And even if we can agree uh, uh, before the end of the year, uh, bear in mind what's agreed will have to be ratified uh, in Westminster, will also have to be ratified uh, by the European Parliament um, and uh, even when all of that is done, uh, then we begin the talks on the future relationship. Uh, so uh, there's no clean break here. Uh, Brexit is going to go on uh, for a very long time, um, and uh, uh, we'll do our best to, to work through it and make sure we get the best outcome for our citizens. Okay, thank you. The, the question, one of the questions that was asked there was, what does it mean for the current dependencies? The, the answer quite simply is, uh, as First Minister of Wales, when would it, or how often would I meet the Chief Minister of the Alma? How often would I meet the Chief Minister of Jersey or of Guernsey? The answer is, it would be a very, very rare occasion, I suspect, if it wasn't for this council. So it's a great opportunity uh, for us to be able to talk to administrations that otherwise we, wouldn't, we probably wouldn't talk to very, very regularly. Uh, so that's a huge advantage. Uh, for me, as somebody who's been coming in for nine years as First Minister, as my last um, British Irish Council, what I've seen is I've seen the council grow from what was really a talking shop. It was there because of the Good Friday Agreement, but it didn't really have much idea of what its purpose was at that time, into not a decision-making body, as the teacher said, but certainly a body that uh, approaches different uh, topics on a task and finish basis. We work together to find uh, common ways forward. We learn from each other. Uh, and 
outside the council itself, we have obviously bilateral meetings, they're very useful as well. So for me, it's a huge opportunity for, for all of us who live in this part of the world uh, to be able to, to talk to each other uh, and to learn from each other, uh, which will be lost if this forum didn't exist. So it's been very valuable, and I've seen it, as I said, grow over the last, the last nine years from something that was a bit vague in terms of what its purpose was to a body that's far more focused now uh, than it certainly was then. Okay, last question, I'm afraid, because some unfortunately some of our colleagues have to, a plane to catch. Lady on the third row. Uh, Vicky Hawthorne from UTV in Belfast. Mr Lillington, can I ask you, given the Prime Minister's letter to the DUP uh, in the last number of days, does it mean uh, any chance of getting a Brexit deal through Parliament has been lost? And also to the Taoiseach, leader Brad Carlin, who you say you can't comment on behalf of anybody else, what are your concerns about the communications you're hearing between the DUP and the Prime Minister? Well, I think that um, we remain very determined to get a good deal that works for every part of the United Kingdom and which uh, we also think would work well for the EU27. They, after all, are going to remain our closest neighbours in the world, a community of democracies based on the rule of law and human rights, uh, with whom we will want to work closely on a number of big international issues, um, whether that is countering terrorism and organised crime, or whether that is about working together on uh, the threat posed by climate change. Um, and in respect of uh, the Irish border, as, as I said earlier, we remain committed to the approach that was set out uh, in a very balanced way in the joint report of last December, which in itself reflected the balance inherent in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement between the different traditions, uh, identities and aspirations in Northern Ireland. Um, I think that if we get the uh, withdrawal agreement and the accompanying political declaration, which I hope that we can secure uh, in the weeks to come, that that will create a new dynamic. I think that members of Parliament, and members of the European Parliament too, as the Taoiseach reminded us, um, will be looking at what that deal says. It will no longer be a question of some hypothetical outcome uh, to which anybody might wish to add or subtract their own particular preferences, but a, a uh, a, a set of documents, a pair of documents that will have been agreed and endorsed by the government of the United Kingdom and by the 27 other governments of the member states of the European Union, of, led by politicians of left, right and centre. So there will be a product on the table which um, all will have signed up to that will have involved compromises give and take on, on, on all sides. Uh, and I think then uh, people will need to ask themselves, what is it that is going to be in the best interests of those who sent them to Westminster to represent them, to ensure that we maintain living standards and investment and prosperity and employment in our country? And I hope and I believe that we can secure that majority in Parliament for, uh, for the uh, agreement. Yeah, to just to answer your question, um, you know, I, I have no specific concerns about the communications that are happening between uh, Prime Minister May and the DUP. It's entirely appropriate that there should be uh, communication on an issue uh, of real importance um, to all of us. Um, the only thing that I would say is that uh, it is very important that we listen to the voice of Northern Ireland in all of this. And when we listen to the voice of Northern Ireland, uh, we should listen to all political parties, we should listen to farmers, to fishermen, uh, to the business community, to trade unions and to civil society. And I think if we do that, and if we listen to um, the voice of Northern Ireland as a whole, uh, that will help us to come to an agreement. Thank you.